All right. Hello. I'm Cindy O'Neill Diddy. I'm the founder of Exceptional Connections Networking and the Chief Connector. And today we are having a conversation to connect. Let's get real. Our conversation today is with Marley Huber. Um, so our invitation for you to join us today, um, we're going to focus on learn how to utilize the gift of sheltering in place to maximize this time of sheltering in place for the release of creativity that will follow. Um, so Marley, um, I'm gonna keep a little introduction here and then I'll turn things over to her. From childhood, Marley Huber has been attracted to visual patterns. No wonder she uh, migrated to photography. As an adult, she was challenged to dig deep into behavioral patterns after a psych psychologist friend repeatedly stated 95% of the population is motivated by fear, 5% by love. The patterns you will discover in this session are like turning on the light and seeing your brilliance before a gilded mirror for the very first time. When you see the four dimensions of your behavior style bathed in golden light, you will rise to the occasion. You will stand firm, sing your authentic song, and live out your unique purpose. It really is about the light. Beautiful. Um, so Marley, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, this is really exciting to be able to after our, our talk that we had um, yesterday to be able to flush this out for our community as well. I'm delighted to be here, very excited. So today we're gonna to be talking about deep stillness creates a space for creativity. And wow, is this a perfect time to be able to have a conversation about this, con this topic? It's a gift, it it's is a gift. gift. Um, so, you know, what I hope each one will go away with today is that while sheltering at home, you have the perfect environment for creating a landing pad, as I call it a landing pad, to receive creative ideas that will successfully carry you into your next season. And in this session, you will receive language. And that's often what's missing is the language that we need to uh, move ahead. Could you remove that? Um, I don't that's going to confuse people if they see that chart. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to go there. <laughs> um, yeah, tech, today is a technical day here. You, you can put the there. apple tree up. Put the apple tree up. There we go. That's good. Um, in this session, you will receive language for demolishing old structures of confining fears and moving into brilliant light and the easy flow of creative solutions. So um, I have been intrigued for a long time by the picture um, on the Sistine Chapel, the, on the ceiling, of the finger of God reaching out to the finger of Adam. And you probably have all seen that picture and, and it's just, there's this little space. And if you hold your fingers, just like I'm doing right now, you can kind of feel the tension that happens in that space and that gap is where we're going. That is the creative gap. And so I love this one apple on this tree because it's, it's hanging there and you just like, it's ripe fruit, it's ready. We had gotten gleaning in Wenatchee and, and that picture was just, that just said it all. So interestingly, uh, many scientific breakthroughs and creative masterpieces flow out of times of isolation. And we may look at isolation as a negative, but there have been those who have been forced to look at it as a positive, and we can do the same thing. Interestingly, John Bunyan wrote Pilgrim's Progress while he was in prison. And what's interesting about that is there was a little crack of light above his head where he could see the starry sky. And, um, Somehow that inspired him and it inspired people hundreds of years later. Van Gogh, you may recall, painted Starry Sky and he was inspired by John Bunyan who wrote Pilgrim's Progress. What you probably don't know is aside from the Bible, Pilgrim's Progress is the most published book in the English language. And uh, how I know that is when I was getting my master's in librarianship, we had to do um, research the history of the publishing history of a book. And my roommate chose 
Pilgrim's Progress, which was a big mistake because her, her, her paper went on and on and on because it is the most published book. But you think about that, he did it while in isolation in prison. Isaac Newton developed calculus and discovered gravity while in quarantine. Isn't that interesting? Um, it was the bubonic plague and he went off and developed calculus. St. Paul wrote 28% of the New Testament while under house arrest. Handel wrote the Messiah during 22 days of self-imposed exile. And he had been given the words, he went into his room, he closed the door, and he said the music came to him. And my understanding is they poked food into him periodically. But for 22 days he wrote, and it is called, it's considered the highest, the epic, the highest point in musical composition. Shakespeare wrote his top flight stage play, King Lear, while in quarantine. So are you getting inspired? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's the amazing. It is, it's amazing, isn't it? And yeah. I'm sure the list goes on and on and on. But to know that what these people did has endured for hundreds of years is amazing, that they did it during times of silence. So when you combine uh, your giftedness with your field of training, um, and you, you, where you've developed skills, then you have the perfect environment for creative expression. So now is your time. Now is your time for to pause um, in confinement and in for reflection, and to focus on your natural gifting and training. And uh, we have it a luxury. So if you consider this time we have as luxury time to do something amazingly creative, um, who knows how long your song will echo through the decades or even centuries. So creative. Creativity does hang like fully ripened fruit in the gap between courage and wonder. And just as I mentioned the Sistine Chapel, I want you to, th to keep that little, that idea of that little gap in mind. It's, there's a tension there it, that is amazing. And I like to talk about courage and wonder. And as I was, uh, Cindy was saying yesterday that often her creativity happens in the shower and it does for me too. <laughs> and so today I was, I was in there and I often use my little equation I'm going to share with you next when I'm in the shower just to center myself in this place of creativity. And today when I did that, I got a new declaration or mantra, however you want to call that. And it is today I choose to arise with courage and descend into wonder. Mm. So if you think I'm arising with courage, you could draw an arrow coming up on a page and I'm descending in wonder. And in that, that space is where there's such rich creativity. Mm, that's so that's, that's the simplicity of it. That's beautiful. I love that, Marley. And just for the, the viewers, I want to make sure that we have five points that Marley's going to be covering and we're going to be discussing um, the first that she talked about when she was going through the contribution to society that many of the inventors um, in the past have done. So that's the first point is many great scientific breakthroughs and creative masterpieces flow out of the time of isolation. And then cre uh, the second one that Marley just uh, started to address is creativity hangs like fully ripened fruit in the gap between courage and wonder. So I just wanted to keep us on track with the five points if you guys are taking notes. Yeah. So the little equation that I use is humble awe plus radical trust equals fertile soil for creativity. And humble awe is that wonder. It's that, and we're not ready for this one yet. Either. We're not ready for that one? Okay. Yeah, just, just keep the apple tree on there. Okay. Now we're ready. Um, so humble awe is wonder. And it's what, it's that childlike wonder. You have a little kid and you're trying to take him shopping and they're stopping to pick up the rocks or the pebbles or a little tiny flower. And you're like, come on, let's go. But they are, they are such, in such an exploratory stage that they are exploring. Wonder is all about them. And that's what we want to get back to. So there's a humility and there's an awe. And that's combined with radical trust. 
And it's really stepping out and doing something that's outside of our comfort zone. It's different. Um, so humble awe relates to the extrovert part of our personality, which requires us to step into that place of wonder. And it's not our natural state. But with language, we can bridge that and discover how to uh, bridge that gap. Radical trust relates to the introverted part of our personality and we caught whoops sorry <laughs> trying to put my paper somewhere where i can see it uh, refers to the introverted part of our personality and requires courage it's not our natural state either but once again language can uh, bridge the gap of unbelief and conformity to old habits so stepping into the place of courage and wonder is fertile ground for um, just enlargement and neither one of these are, are natural to us. So now what we're going to do is we're gonna look at our four behavior styles. Now you can put the chart up and Chuck will appreciate this because he teaches this material. The, uh, yeah, that one. And you probably, many of you have probably taken the assessments where um, you know there's four styles. That, and I've used the terms dominant, influencer, steady, and compliant to describe these. And um, you may have heard of them as choleric, sanguine, melancholic, and phlegmatic, or there are other terms that are, are commonly used. These are the ones I chose to use because this is um, the program of study that I went through. Um, this is what we use. So the dominant style over to the far left is the extrovert that focuses on tasks, very task-oriented personality. And if we look at this uh, chart, this bar graph uh, go, as going from zero to 100, zero being on the one bottom, 100 on the top, 50 in the middle, we get three um, words or, uh, that describe who we are at these various stages. At zero is the position of humility or meekness. And this is a, a a place where you're sitting at the feet of the master teacher and you're saying, I, my task today is to be a learner. And so basically, Marley, um, for those who are looking at the chart, it's on the far right on the bottom. So the bottom humility with all zealous bottom. and radical is all the zero level. Right? Yes. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah, that's the zero level. So we're just looking at the one at the far left, the dominant. And so when we are in a place of receptivity and learning, uh, we humble ourselves to, to learn. And if you go to 50, that's, um, that's the place of balance and it's a place of purpose. I know my purpose. If you go to 100, it's very driving and demanding. That's the person that says, I will conquer this. I will, um, you know, climb this mountain, I will take out this army, I will do whatever it needs to accomplish my mission. And some of us, um, you know, we fall at different places on this chart. So it has to do, if you go over to the left, it says the will. This is our will, our determination to solve the problem. And we might be a natural 30 or or maybe we're a flexible 70, and maybe we know someone who's a driving 100, and they are driving all the time. So what our goal is in this is to set our landing pad for creativity, and we want to set our dominant um, thermostat to zero. So in order to be receptive to creativity, it requires humility. It requires just being receptive to the wisdom, the knowledge, the creativity that's flowing through the atmosphere and uh, is available to us. It's probably not our natural state, but it's the best state for being receptive to the brilliance that's literally floating right by us. So um, the second one. So can I, can I just jump yeah. in for a second? So this is the state that we talked about where you're walking in humility, of course, like you said, um, you're listening, you're observing, mm -hmm. you're, you know, so instead of solving problems, which is the normal mode of a dominant person, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think about, you know, 
when you're giving, when you're talking to your husband and you're telling him what's going on and he's wanting to solve the problem, right? Instead of listen. Right. So this is where, this is more of a passive state that you're putting yourself into. Exactly. Good choice of words. Yes, it is passive. It's like a, my task right now is to be receptive, not to, not to solve the problem. So the next um, uh, quadrant is the influencer style, and that's the extrovert, but it's how we relate to people. It, that part of our um, quadrant of our behavior style is totally focused on relationships. And so if we have an, um, a spectrum there from zero to 100, withdrawn, totally withdrawn from people is at the zero point. Um, at the 100 point is totally effusive. It, it means I am just over the top, over the top. Um, I, can, I can get this way. People sometimes say, Marley, you're too much. <laughs> it's when I'm, I'm really dancing in my effusive influencer place. Um, this is the expression and the soul. And you see that to the left. At the 50% mark is the word charming. And often when we hear the word charming, we think, like snake charmers or somebody that's going to use something on us to beguile us. But actually the word charming comes from the French and it has to do with singing your song, being uniquely you, being authentic and just singing your song in such a powerful way that when you sing this song, people find it very compelling. Um, it's not put on, it's not, it's not over the top. It's just so crystal pure. And um, let's see. So to set our, our thermostat on the flu influencer point or quadrant for zero, we withdraw from our public. It's a place of withdrawing. Now, I'm not looking at it in a negative sense of I'm withdrawn and I'm in a hole and I'm depressed but I'm looking at it in a place of maybe I'm in my shower, maybe I'm out in nature and I'm walking, I'm all there by myself. And I've, I've lowered that um, thermometer, so to, the thermostat to this humble place of receptivity on my dominant, my task oriented. I've also identified, isolated myself from others. So I'm creating a landing pad for really listening to what's, what's there. This is a beautiful time for the influencer to embrace, right? If you want to <laughs> manage your influencer style. Yes. Um, it, because it's, you know, with social distancing, we're being asked to pull back. Mm -hmm. And some people, you know, you, you mentioned this is the extroverts. Extroverts have a hard time with this, right? But the introverts um, are happy right now. <laughs> introverts are like, yes. I don't have to go anywhere. I can do things in my pajamas. I can be home. And I saw my, my husband works for a huge company and they sent everybody home, but he's an engineer that does firmware. And he said, I wouldn't have anything to do at home. So he's there in a pod that generally contains about 30 people and there are three people. And he is loving it because he is the steady compliant, which we're gonna talk about next, steady compliant personality style. He is in heaven. He says, I don't know what I'm going to do when everybody comes back. <laughs> so um, yeah, this is his joy time. So it's a good thing I know some things about creativity so I can keep myself occupied <laughs> in my isolation. So the third quadrant is that steady style. And it has to do with the heart and with the emotions. And you think of the heart as it beats, rhythm. And that steady person will have a beat. They'll have a rhythm to how they do life. And at zero, they're zealous. They are running. They're, that's the person you can't keep up with. It's like, where do they go now? Where are they? Because they're always off and running and doing something. But at 100, you will probably find them either taking a bath or taking a nap. And I know this from personal experience because my best friend growing up, Every time I call her house, invariably, she was either taking a nap or taking a bath. She has since apologized, but that was her place of, of um, just centering herself. 
And it can be a place, if there's been deep pain and a lot of woundedness, it can be a place where we hide. Uh, for her, as a, as a six-year-old, she lost her daddy to cancer. And so I'm sure there were, she, there were, she really needed that bath. She really needed that nap to, to keep herself going when her mom had like three different jobs just to put food on the table. So, um, it's interesting because when you're very high, when you have a lot of the steadiness, you move at a very slow rate. So you would make an excellent nurse nursing someone back to health. Whereas somebody who's way down near the bottom, you know, zero, 10, 15, 20, they're fast paced. They're like an get well, you know, just get well, get over it. <laughs> you don't want them nursing you. Not high in compassion, right? <laughs> no, they're like, come on. <laughs> and see, that was me. I'm, come on, let's go swimming. No, I just took a bath, you know. Um, and so at the 50% point, uh, you, you get this, this sense of movement with the steady. So at 100, they're, they're in a horizontal position. At zero, they're running. But at the 50%, they're standing erect, they're standing. And you think about the secret service men who guard the president and they stand at attention. They're not running, they're not hiding, they're, they're, they're focused, they're standing erect. And that's what the 50% point is. Um, anything you wanna add there, Cindy? No, I just love that. I love the visual of you know reclining, standing firm you know grounded mm -hmm. and then also zealous you're just like on the move action right. and right. I, I just love that visual it's so beautiful and you wouldn't think there would be that much movement in that you know uh -huh. um that would a continuum when you have the title steady mm -hmm. but i love the juxtaposition of the word you know which is like right. anchored and right. then the continuum gives yeah. you the full range. It's beautiful. Yeah, and it has to do with our heart. It's, it's that rhythm. We all have a natural rhythm. So with this, um, what we're doing to, to come into this place of humble awe and radical trust, it means it's going to require some movement. We have to let go of the, the deep down emotions that have held us back and made us cautious because we're going to run. This is the place to put your 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 faith on and run. Uh, you put it on and, okay, I've got confidence. Something is going to come when I get myself into this space. Okay, the fourth one is the arena of the mind. And this is where a lot of people are being really active right now because their minds are going, what's going to happen next? What's going to happen? You know, what's going to happen to me financially? What's going to happen to us socially? There's a lot of things going on. And we are being rocked in this quadrant. So at zero, it's radical. And you have to say that what we're doing now, what we're, in, what we're living in right now is pretty radical, pretty revolutionary to what we're normally used to. So fit, at 100, that's rigidity. It's like, we've always done it this way. We're always gonna do it this way. It's tradition. It means that when you go into a meeting place, maybe you go to a church or a school class, you always sit in the same seat. I remember when I was a little girl, my dad was a pastor of a church and there was one place where the full floor was grooved out because this woman was in her 80s. She had sat in that spot for decades and you could see the grooves on the floor from her feet moving back and forth. <clears throat> so it's a highly compliant individual. At the 50% point, you're firm, but you're not rigid. You, you're not going to break. You're not going to crack. So um, the interesting thing is um, to move out of this compliance and, and to move into that radical space, you have to let go of the way all things have always been. So what we're going to move to now is... Um, uh, part four, which is what I call radiant life mapping. This is a master chart that we can move that and move it to that one, Cindy. There we go. This is a chart that I put together, oh, about 15 years ago. 
that revolutionized my life in many, many ways. And it was after I had taken training and been certified in behavior style assessments and I was a life coach and I, this chart just totally uh, transformed my life. So you see that I have placed the four quadrants around to form a, like a cross. Uh, dominance over, over to the right, influencers on the bottom, steadies to the left, and compliant is to the top. In the middle, I have the word love. Because, and then you'll see too that the zero is the same chart, it's just kind of shrunk up. So zero is right next to love, and then 50, and then 100 is way out. If we were to color code this, we would make the area out beyond 100 a very dark, dark color. And we would have a few crazy critters floating around in there, some little demon type things and zombies or whatever, things that, uh, that make us shriek in the night. Because this is where fear is. And what led me to this is as I began to study the four personality styles, I realized that each one of the styles has a fear that is their motivation. They're motivated by that fear. They respond to fear. So if we look at the dominant individual, uh, their big fear is fear of loss of control. And uh, when we were getting ready today <laughs> and the password wasn't working and all of that, there was some fear of loss of control going on <laughs> because suddenly the technology wasn't working. And when you're in charge of an event like Cindy is on this one, that's the last thing you want to encounter is loss of control when, you know, the technology is just not working for you. So interestingly, the opposite of fear is love. And how do I say that? Uh, I want you to think about a scene. There's a busy street. There's a mother with a little child. And suddenly that little child darts into the street. And that mother runs after that child, not thinking about her life, but thinking about the life of her child. So her fear of being hit in traffic is overwhelmed, overtaken by her love for that child. And she, she's, uh, it's, it doesn't matter about my life. It matters about my child's life. Um, if you've ever watched the, mo uh, the movie um, While You Were Sleeping, um, the main um, actor runs onto the tracks of the L to save this man's life who she's secretly fallen in love with every time he puts his ticket in her little ticket booth. Uh, she just disregards fear and she goes to save his life. So fear and love are like oil and water. You cannot have, you can't have them both. They don't, they don't stay together. There's fear or love. And that's the thing. When we go back down to that zero point of, um, of being humble, we're stepping into that position of love. We're honoring someone else. We're saying, I want to learn from you. And that's being teachable. That's, that's being receptive to what's there that we can um, tap into. So if we go to the influencer part, you'll see the same thing. We live in a society that's highly, mo highly populated by influencers in the younger generation. And we see that with all the attraction to social media. And it's important for these people that they take a selfie in front of every national park icon and every big city um, space needle or whatever, because they have to say, I was there, I was there. And um, it, their big fear is the fear of rejection. We have lived in a celebrity oriented environment where we want to be loved. We want to be accepted. So for the influencer, it's real important to them that they get lots of likes and that they get lots of comments. And they work their influencer so that they do get lots of likes and lots of comments because this um, settles that fear of rejection. Mm. So, <clears throat> so you can see that there's a dotted line that runs from the top right to the bottom left. And that shows these, these are our extrovert. And uh, control and rejection are their two big 
issue. They do not want to, um, to lose control in those areas. <clears throat> If we move over to the steady side, this is the heart. Remember, this is the heart. And in our heart is where we carry so many of the, the wounds of our life and some of the memories and the failures and those kinds of things. At 100, that steady individual fears taking responsibility. Um, they fear failure. And underneath it all, they, there's shame. What if people see who I really am? Uh, if they really knew who I was, they wouldn't like me. So when, I, when you're in a group and you see highly capable people and you ask for a show of hands, who will volunteer to do this? And you know someone is highly capable in that area and they just sit there, they will not raise their hand because they don't want to take responsibility because they might fail because their shame might be exposed. However, if you call on them and you are very... Um, relational and saying, Jeff, you would be perfect. Oh my goodness, you're perfect for this. Then suddenly that overcomes that fear and they're able to arise to the occasion. So Marley, talk about how you have it. Um, one of the cross sections, of course, is the introvert and the extrovert. So the introverts are the compliant and the steady, right? Personalities. Right. And then the extroverts are the dominant and influencer. And then the, on the other kind of side of the quadrant, it talks about um, the task versus relationship. Right. So you're going to be getting into that also. Yeah. So yeah. The steady and the influencer, they, they are more relational. Um, they come from a place of relationships versus the compliant and dominant. They're more task oriented. Right. That's very true. Um, the compliant and this is where they are so much. You go into a grocery store, particularly a couple of weeks ago, and oh my goodness, you could literally, the fear was palpable because people are, they're afraid of the unknown. They're afraid of ambiguity. What does the future hold? Will I get this uh, virus? Will I not? Who's carrying it? What's going to happen to me? And this is a very cerebral area. It's the place of the mind. And the huge fear is that fear of the future, the fear of ambiguity. They're task oriented. They want to comply. They want to do things the way they've always done them. But suddenly they're having to be radical, put on a mask, stay six feet away. And it's not working with the way they have always done things makes it's kind of interesting isn't it how how that is so um there's one thing about me it's i always get my papers mixed up so, <laughs> so we're on uh, to three page three where it says <laughs> influencer style steady style compliant style at the top Right, and I, I photocopy, I, yeah, I copied them and they're all different. <laughs> so, um, let's see. So what this gives you is really some language to work with. So how do I get into this center spot? Because this center spot, this love spot is the place of passion. If you look at it like, you know, you think love is fire and passion, activity, uh, and you think out there on the peripheral is more like ice. Nobody runs to watch ice freeze. We don't run to, oh, I'm gonna go out to the pond and watch that, watch the water freeze. We don't do that. But if there's a fire, you can be sure everybody in, you know, in that area is running over there to see that fire. We run to fire. And so that's what this lit center area is called, I call love. It's the place of passion, it's the place of creativity, it's the place where the sparks are flying. And um, when we're in this position of humble awe and radical trust, we have basically reduced ourselves to this place of, of, um, of receptivity on the extrovert part of us, but activity on the introvert part of us. So I, I kind of came up with this little, um, I said, I think I said this earlier. Today, I choose to arise with courage. And it means I'm going to get my, my steady and my compliant down to zero. And I'm going to have to rise up. I'm going to change things to get there. Because naturally, I may be 
more methodical, I may be more traditional, but if I want to think outside the box, I have to let go of the fear of the future and the fear of taking responsibility, and I need to arise with courage. And the fear of not looking good. And the fear of not looking good. Yes. Right? <clears throat> and then I have to descend into wonder. And you know, those extrovert people, that's hard for them to do. It's hard for them to sit and look at whatever, a lily pad for an hour. Photography has taught me to sit. And I have to say my husband's 90 day trip, our bicycle trip across America in 2012, while he was biking, I had a camera and I, sometimes I would sit by a dead sunflower head curled around um, a fence for an hour waiting for him. I have to find beauty, there's beauty somewhere here. And I learned how to take that um, dominant influencer part of myself and bring it down and be amazed at wonder. Now I have a friend who's very much steady and compliant. That woman can sit and look at a painting or a flower for an hour a day. I've showed her my photography and she will sit and study it and talk about it. And I'm like, how can anyone do this? She pulls all kinds of things out of it. So you see it's, it's um, bringing that part, bringing all four parts to that center place. And that's where we have this tension between wonder and courage. So Marley, um, it seems like people, you know, I know for myself, I get comfortable you know, when you're talking about the four different behavior styles, I find that I get comfortable in one space um, because we're used to it, right? Exactly. And so you're encouraging exactly. us to get outside of our comfort zone, yeah. especially during times like these when there's a lot of change and we're, you know, the tendency is, would be to pull back. Mm -hmm. But in actuality, if we want to really be effective, it's yeah. we have to do the opposite, right? Let's do the opposite of our natural our natural way of being. Um, so can you talk about the, looking at the four fears, um, can you talk about, name the fear that um, seems to be most limiting? We talked about that for each one, um, but how can, how can we use, how can we use this, which, you know, you talk about fear to really be able to propel us forward? You know, I think it's looking at it and going, what's the worst thing that could happen? Okay, so worst case scenario kind yeah, of- what's the worst thing that's happened? I mean, why, am, why has this got me? Why do I have to be in control here? What happens if I could let go of control? Right. Um, so it's being able to, um, to let go because it, that's really what it is. The four, the, the four extremes are pushing out and it's how do I let go? Right. And so what I like to do, and I have, these words have been words that I carry with me all the time, humble awe, radical trust. Mm -hmm. And so frequently I will go, okay, I need to come into a space of humble awe. And I need to come into a space of radical trust. Mm, those are great. Or you could say courage and wonder. Yeah, those are beautiful. Uh, you know, I, I remember a story from years ago. Uh, about a woman, a bus pulled up to the Grand Canyon and they all filed off. And this one woman got out, she picked up her lipstick and her compact and she's putting on her lipstick and she throw, asks over her shoulder, how soon do we have lunch? She's standing on the edge of one of the most incredible sights that any one of us will ever see. She's putting on her lipstick, which is all going to come off with lunch. <laughs> and, and she's saying, when's lunch? And I'm like, who asks about lunch when they're standing on the edge of wonder? Mm. That's beautiful. Yeah. So it's, it's letting go. I don't have to be in control. I don't have to know when lunch is. Can I just stand here? Can I study a flower? Can I listen to a bird sing? Um, it's that simplicity. Can I have that childlike um, curiosity? Because when we have that childlike curiosity, that's when, you know, 
um, you can come up with calculus or King Lear or John Bunyan. I can come up with, you know, Pilgrim's Progress. That's when you can write music that is so profound, it stirs the soul. You can be present, right? That's you, when you you're present. Yes, you're present. And so often I've seen different um, movies where they talk about where it's about composers or musicians and someone will look at their, listen to your music and say, you're not there. Start over. What do you mean I'm not there? I've worked so hard. No, you're not there. You haven't really plumbed the depth of who you are. You haven't really become clear on what your song is, what your purpose is, and you're not standing firm in that. And then when they do, when they really do get to that place of humble awe and radical trust, they produce music that goes to the world. Mm -hmm. I just got this thought in my head, being present is the present you're not present to. Being present is the present you're not present to because it's a gift, right? It's something that we can embrace and it's a place we can stand. Um, Well, I want to be able to kind of segue here because you're talking about about the big fears, right? Of each Mm -hmm. of each of the behavior styles. And then you, you, when you and I were talking, I was really intrigued by the conversation about languaging and how, Um, you have the language, now that you've identified the fear, you have the language to be able to uh, beat it at its own game, if you will, right? Right. So talk to us about that. Okay, so remember at the very first in the introduction, I uh, mentioned the psychologist who it was in a networking meeting, interestingly, every week, I mean, every week without fail, he would come and he would say, 95% of the population is motivated by fear five percent by love and we'd hear him and then one day he walked up to me and he said marley you're motivated by love and i i was taken aback and i'm like how do you know i mean you don't really know me you see me once a week how do you know well that's what sent me on this journey because if you look at this chart and imagine that 95% of the people are pushing out into one of those four fears, 5% have found that place of courage and wonder. And they're living life. They're singing their song from that place. They're, um, they know their purpose. They're standing firm, firm in their identity. They're not worrying about being rejected or losing control or what the future holds or whether they're Uh, they're going to fail. And that's what's required. So you think about some of these greats, you think about John Bunyan in that prison cell. How did he know he would ever get out of that cell? How did he know that if he picked up a piece of paper and began writing the story that was forming in his brain, that it would ever go to anybody? How did he know? I mean, he was in a place where he had no control. He was totally rejected, placed in the prison. How did he know? But somehow the inspiration of looking through that little crack at night and seeing those stars up there, put him in this position of wonder, somehow gave him the courage to say, I'm going to put the first line on paper. And there's, interestingly, there's a Hebrew letter called Yod. And that Yod is just like a tiny little comma. And it's considered the spark. And they say that the spark happens as soon as you put your pen to paper. So whenever you put your pen to paper, whether you're drawing, whether you're writing a musical composition, when you're either ready composing a letter or writing a bestseller, that spark is initiated by the action, the courage of putting the pen to the paper and beginning to allow the flow uh, from inside. So with the language, what I have found as I've, um, excuse me, as I've taught this material over the years, what I have found is that when people have this language, they have this chart, they can have it in their mind, they have this um, uh, cross-shaped chart, and they can begin to identify where their fears are they can release them. They're bringing them into the daylight. And when they're exposed to the daylight, you know what's scary at night isn't scary in the daytime. 
you think of a little child. I think of my bedroom when I was a little girl and there was this closet under the eaves and there were the locust trees scraping on the roof and there were the dark shadows out the window. Well, I was afraid, but in the daylight, I could open that closet, there's nothing in there. I could look out the window, there's nothing on the second story window. And that's how it is when you have language. You expose these fears, these inhibitions to light, and you're able to step out of those fears into love. I was telling Cindy that last weekend, I, I was finishing up a jigsaw puzzle. And you know, when you get down to the end, all the colors look pretty much the same. And you see the shape, I need one that kind of looks like this. And then you go over to your pile, it's like, oh my goodness, how will I find that? Well, what I've learned to do is when I get down there probably the last 50 or 75, I put them in six piles and I've named them. There's the females, there's the males, there's the quartet, there's the mother with child, there's the whirly gig or the spinner, and let's see, there's one more. There's, um, there's the three brothers and a sister. And so when I look at my puzzle, I go, oh, this requires a whirly gig. I'm, I go right to my little pile and I can, maybe there's only six or eight of those and I can test them. That's how it is with language. Once you have language and you begin to see this and you know what your style is, you know what your fear is, then you can say, okay, today I choose to step into this deep stillness of creativity. And you can do this throughout the day. So I, the last chart, let's see, do we, do we have that as a chart or not? The no, we didn't, but I love that, Marley. Thank you. And I, I just to wrap a bow around that concept, it's, you know, when you name your fear, you're releasing it. When you name your fear, when you language it, like you said, you're taking all the power out of it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I love the juxtaposition of day and night mm -hmm. and then fear and love and how languaging is so important to be able to identify it. And once we identify it, then we can deal with it. You know, it's interesting. I, I've taught, like I said, I've taught this material in multi-week courses. And um, I remember one time teaching it and there was a woman in the class who had, she did not know what was holding her back from losing weight. And she needed to lose probably about a hundred pounds. She had tried every modality, everything she could do to lose weight. And it wasn't until she saw the chart that had to do with 95% are motivated by fear and 5% by love. And she got the language around fear and how it was debilitating that she was able to release, um, it, it set her on a track of releasing about 100 pounds and she's kept it off. Hmm. And it was amazing. She just needed the language to know what was the debilitating fear? So <clears throat> let's step into um, creating this landing pad for creativity. Well, it's been scheduled for us, folks. <laughs> How many more days we have, we don't know. But I'm, I'm not going to ask you to spend all day in this place of courage and wonder because we're not, we're not disciplined to do that. But you are going to need to schedule some time. And Maybe it's start with five minutes and maybe it's build it up to 30. Um, maybe it's finding that place where you can be still, you can be alone and you're inspired. Um, maybe it's the shower. Uh, the, I think the reason the shower works is there's water, there's flow and creativity always flows. It's that creative open space where there's flow. It's not a controlled closed place where you're just standing in a box but you're in this creative open space. Maybe it's going out in the, the middle of a forest. I don't know if you have trees in your backyard or you have a quiet escape place where you can go and you can settle in and set a timer, set a timer for five minutes and then mentally walk this chart. Um, when I have taught this material up at our cabin, we have a cul-de-sac out in front and I have gone out in front of the house and I have drawn this chart out and we literally walk the chart. We go find our big fear that is the one that tends to dominate us and we walk into the center. And it's a powerful moment when you have people coming from all four directions and you meet in the center and you can literally feel uh, that, that creative awe and that tension. It, it's amazing because mentally you're letting go you're saying i'm letting go and if you need to walk it through all four quadrants walk it through all four quadrants because you want to let go of the fear 
and you want to step into this place of, of, of love, of creativity, of flow, of the sparks flying. Mm. So you want to come um, with a pen and a notebook because what happens is when you're in this receptive spot and the ideas start flying, you will lose them if you don't write them down. They are spiritual. They have come from a spiritual source. And if you don't write them down, they're lost. I've had so many times where I'm like, oh, what was that? What was that? Because sometimes you will just speak it out and you'll go, oh my goodness, that's it. But if you don't have a pen or a paper or not, not able to record at that moment, you can lose it. And it comes from deep within. It comes from the core of your being. And it's so creative. So always have something to um, either write it down or, you know, I would allow you the, the discipline of having the phone for recording. Just turn all the notifications off. Do not respond to anything. Marley, I love when you talked about, when we, were, when we had our conversation, you talked about imagining that the four behavioral styles are a slide, like a playground slide. Yeah. Tell us about that. Well, it's true. You know, fear can be a high place of negativity. And as a child, you probably can remember, or you, maybe you've seen a little one be at the very top of a tall slide. And there's that point at which you have to move from standing there holding on to sitting down and letting go. And that's really what this is. It's about letting go in all four uh, uh, quadrants. And, uh, you know, letting go of the task that you, you got to do or the people that you've got to be in relationship with because you're letting go to this free fall. And when you have that free fall in four dimensions, it is so powerful. You will get creative ideas. You will get witty inventions. You will get things that will hold you steady, even in times of great uncertainty. Uh, it might be just a line that comes to you. It might be a musical score. It could be an idea for a book or a business or a training. So many things come. But see, we have to let go. That's, that's really it. We have to let go of, of those fears, of the need to task right now or relate right now and just be in that that space. It's like sitting by a campfire and seeing sparks fly from the fire. They're only visible momentarily and you want to catch that. And so yesterday when we talked, Cindy, I, we talked about um, uh, Wilbur and um, the Limber, uh, what's her name? Uh, um, yeah. The, yeah. <laughs> the guys, the, the, fly, the flying guys, you know. The Wright brothers. The Wright brothers, right. The Wright brothers were two young guys who went to Kitty Hawk, North Carolina. They had an idea. They were working on this. They wanted to fly a plane. How would they do this? And they're building this thing. You know, they kind of let go of all of these fears. Well, they didn't have a lot to lose. They didn't have a lot of money behind them. They, in fact, their father, this is an interesting story about their father. He was in conversation, their father was a pastor. He was in conversation with a bishop one day. And the, and the father said, you know, I think they should close the patent office because all, everything that's ever been, will be created has already been discovered and created. I don't think we need the patent office. Guess what? <laughs> he had two sons who did not buy into his rigidity, into his, well, this is the way it's always been and it couldn't possibly change. He had two sons that weren't worried about the future. They weren't worried about failure. They weren't worried about being rejected. They weren't worried about loss of control. They got out there and did it. What's interesting is there was a man who worked for the Smithsonian um, Institute and he was quite scholarly and learned and he set out to be the first one who would fly an airplane and he had the financial backing and he had all the controls in place and he had all the scientific know-how and everything but he was kind of nice because we remember his name but we do remember these two young gods who embraced courage and stepped into wonder and said I wonder, I wonder, do you think we could do it? Do you think we could be the first to fly a plane? 
And, and that is the bottom line. That's, that's really what we're going for in this whole um, segment. We're about an hour in, so I think we're Yeah, I love, I love that story. And I love the illustration because the Wright brothers, they were driven by their passion. And like you said, by wonder and by awe. Yeah. As opposed to the Smithsonian guy that we don't even remember his name. I've heard it in the past, but I don't recall yeah. it. Um, he was, it, it, when I heard the story, I was just blown away because he, we, he could have, with all his backing, with all the support yeah. that he had, he could have been the one that we remembered, mm -hmm. but he gave up mm -hmm. as soon as the Wright brothers, you know, broke that threshold and were, you know, the first ones to fly, yeah. he gave up. So his, obviously his passion wasn't driving him. He had other motivations. And for him, it was like, oh, I can't yeah. claim that. Mm -hmm. So I'm out. Yeah. Yet he could have gone so much further than the Wright brothers. So I, I love that illustration of how passion is such an integral part. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's kind of like uh, the, uh, what are they, David and Goliath? <laughs> yeah. That's very much that way. Yeah. You got David with his slingshot mm -hmm. and then Goliath. And yet who overcomes? So it's very encouraging to be able to, you know, have those examples that we can push into when we feel like we're not enough, when right. we feel inadequate, when we feel, you know, like there's um, something that we're coming against that's bigger and badder than us and yeah. we have no yeah. chance against it. Passion is underrated. Oh, absolutely. Right? Yeah. yeah. So what would you like to say to put a bow on our conversation here? And we're going to open it up for Q&A and discussion um, with the people that have joined us today. How would I put a bow on it? I, I think I would say make it a daily exercise to step into courage, to rise up in courage and descend into wonder. Hmm. It's beautiful. I'm going to go ahead and pull us out of here. Let me see if I can do this. I've been having technical challenges all day long. It's been really fun. <laughs> so let me see here. I'm going to stop share. There we are. Here we are. Here we are. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and Everybody, you can unmute yourself if you have any questions. Um, and really, this is more than just not having questions. This is, you know, to enter into the conversation and be able to play with us. Because I, I have to tell you, I had such an amazing time just being able to hear from Marley what you've been able to, you know, hear today and just enter into her wonder and awe and be able to dance with her in this. So thank you for joining us today. And I'm trying to unmute people, but some people might need to unmute themselves. Um, so anybody have any ahas or questions or um, epiphanies that came to them as Marley was sharing her process? I'll start. I want to thank you, Marley, for doing. I just, I, I wrote a lot of things. I just had a lot of download and I want to capture it all, but it, you know, I, I could only write it a certain amount, but thank you so much. Um, your conversation, your, your piece just opened up so many ideas. So one of the things I really took from me is um, combine your training and your gifts, which comes to creativity. Mm -hmm. I thought, you know, I think as entrepreneurs, we always think our gift is, you know, serving, but there's other things that we put on the side that doesn't come out of the creativity. I was like, you know, I am creative. Yeah. You know, there's other things I could be creative. So I was like, through my gift, I have so many creativity. It's just that I'm putting a label on it. Uh -huh. And so I want to thank you for that because I wrote that down and then a list of things started coming up like sewing. I've always wanted to learn how to sew and you know, and I have a bunch of African prints that I could, you know, okay. you know, do masks or do something with it. And I have a sewing machine. Maybe that could be time to dust that off for the last uh, sewing machine that somebody gave it to me, you know, 25 years ago. So it really, I wrote all these lists down and then I got lost track of them. I'm like, oh, I need to listen back to what you're saying. So thank you. Oh, and Rachana, I want to thank you too, because uh, you are very smiling. Um, you're very receptive. 
And um, so I felt like I was speaking to you and you were just grabbing it all. It's always fun to be a speaker when there's someone who just grabs it. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. And Allison, Hi. I, when it was really little, I couldn't see it was you, but I see, I'm so <laughs> delighted to see you. This is great. Yeah, it's very good to see you too. Thank yeah. you very much for the information. I just thought that um, in terms of like, the, the one who is steady, you know, in terms of uh, uh, that one just really um, kind of spurred a lot of thought for me because I see myself as somebody who um, I really, I go and go and go and then I have to stay back for a while. So, um, and, and take a rest. And mm -hmm. so um, getting, I think, into that middle part of the, where you're standing versus, mm -hmm. you know, um, being at either end of that, being super, super zealous, yeah. you know, and then, so that's pretty amazing. I, I like that. Um, it, it just kind of gave me a visual of, like, kind of what to go for. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and to be able to, like, sit, sit in, in calmness, which it's, yeah, I, I think that lately, I thought that things were going to slow down for me, but they've been quite busy. And so I, I feel like, oh, geez, I do need to retreat a little bit, yeah. you know, and, and sit back. So that's a good reminder. Thank you. You're welcome. Dara was on and she was saying that her home is pretty uh, busy right now. So she wasn't able to yeah. chime in. Um, but she wanted to thank us for opening our hearts and you sharing your wisdom. And she said, I so appreciate the wonder and awe and the passion part. When creativity is the passion that drives you, anything is possible. That's so yeah. cool. And, and Dara is one who um, dyes fabrics and makes flags. And they're beautiful. Mm. Beautiful. She's very much a creative. That's fun. That's fun. Well, as I was having this conversation with you yesterday and then hearing again, you know, you, you retell and explain the different behavior styles and how it works. I was reminded, I was thinking of you, Chuck, a lot because of the disc style, right? Because it's so similar. A lot of these behavioral styles, you know, uh, Myers-Briggs and some of the ones you mentioned, you know, they have different quadrants and different spectrums and you can be up at one end or the other end. And, you know, when I was first, when I was younger and I was taking some of these tests, I thought it was like right and wrong. And yet we're all different, right? So we have different graphs and charts and, you know, what uh, appeals to us. What I really loved about the cross quadrant and even the graphed ones that you shared is that it really illustrates, I think more than other, um, you know, kind of uh, opportunities to know where you're at, it really illustrates our ability to choose, right? We get to choose where we want to land. I mean, there's where we kind of naturally gravitate. And then it's where we say, you know, like you say, when we're in this place of social distancing, like we are in this time in history right now, which is extraordinary. And because it's not only for our you know, our home and our neighborhood and our, you know, our state and our region and our country. It's the world. We're all going through this simultaneously. And so I think about like on the other side of this, we don't know what it's going to look like, but I can tell you from, especially after your talk, there's a lot of creativity that's kind of coming out. Oh, oh. right. Oh, uh, we are going to see amazing Unprecedented. Unprecedented, yes. We, I, in fact, I believe we're entering a new age of creativity that will be quite profound. Um, as a history major, you know, you study history and there was like, you know, from basically the birth of Christ to 500, there's those dark ages, you know, those ages. And then there's that 1,000 to 1,500, which they call the dark ages, you know. Mm -hmm. And then at 1,500, you had the Renaissance and Reformation, which was a class I took, a fascinating class, and that went to about 2000. Now we're at another 500 mark point. So what is going to happen now? And I truly believe 
we have not, we have no idea the creativity that's going to come out of this space and out of this time right now. It's, it's absolutely profound. So what's been coming to me is, and who knows what history will call it, but I'm calling it the Great Awakening. Oh, you know, I love that. Because yeah. I think we're being called to be awake, alert, and aware. Mm. So I'm an English major, so I like alliteration. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you do. Wake yeah, up. that down. There. So I think that's what, you know, we're being called to do is wake up, you know, wake up. <laughs> and this is our time to be able to reinvent ourselves. This is our time to, you know, a lot of times, I don't, I haven't felt this as much as an adult, but when I was younger, I'd always feel like I'm behind. Like everybody else is so far ahead of me and I've got to catch up. And we've got an opportunity right now where there's a major reset. Worldwide reset button has been pushed. Mm -hmm. And so we're all kind of at the same place right now. And so we have an opportunity to take action that can help us to not only be of service to others in our community and, you know, create the structure, um, so that's what propels me. So for, you know, exceptional connections for our community, I've been busier than ever. Um, and I think I need to just take to heart some of the things you're saying and actually give myself a little bit more of a break, which I know that's coming because I'm starting to buy my starts and get my <laughs> going. And so that time in the garden yeah. is my happy place. Yeah. Um, but it is a reset opportunity. It's an opportunity for us to... Mm -hmm be able to really dig deep into who we are and what we believe and what we're passionate about and let that come forward because we get to reshape this new world of ours, mm -hmm. right? We don't want to let somebody else reshape it. We want to be part of, you know, the solution. And, um, and then, you know, the other thing that drives me personally, and I I'd really appreciate if you guys chime in for, for yourselves, because this is a bigger conversation, right? How it affects our, us, not just from a philosophical or theoretical standpoint. But for me, I, what drives me is I want myself, what I do, who I am, exceptional connections, you know, the things that are, I'm passionate about to be relevant on the other side of this. Because I think that's one of the fears that we're all facing is there's so many things that are changing, so many things that are being dictated, you know, the, whether you're essential or not essential and, you know, <laughs> all of those kind of distinctions. But to be able to think, okay, we've got a paradigm shift here. Things aren't working the way we normally have them. And so for, I'm just going to use exceptional connections, we can't meet physically right now. And when we can, when the social media or social distancing um, ban is lifted, if you will, will we want to? How will people feel about that? Will they feel safe? Yeah. What, what things do we need to change to make people feel safe? So there's that paradigm. And then there's, okay, so I can't do anything about that at the moment. But what I can do is how can I use leverage technology to keep us together, to bring us together? to create community. Um, next so can, I, can I pause right, can sure. I pause you right there? Yes. Um, and I, that's one thing I don't think I mentioned that I should have mentioned. When you go into this space and you say, okay, this is, this is my, my creative space that I wanna be in, go with a purpose or with a question. And so you just had that question, like how will this look? How will creativity look? Or how will, how will we meet up? Will there be technology involved? So if you go in with a focused question, it's very powerful. It's not just, you know, a landing pad for nothingness, but it's, it's very powerful. If I could share a, a story, this was um, from about four years ago. And um, our daughter just recently got married at 35 and she had wanted to be married for years and she had lost hope she would ever meet anyone and was actually a little angry with God because she hadn't and her, like you said, she thought everybody was ahead of her and she was behind. And that tends to be something that we think, well, everybody else is there, they're doing it and here I am stuck over here where I wanna be over there. And I remember the beginning of one year, um, 
And I took kind of the month of January just to really focus on my family in, in this kind of a space. And this particular day, I, I went in my bathroom, which has a nice wicker chair and it's isolated. And I sat down there, I set my timer for 30 minutes and it's like, I want to hear an answer for Anne-Marie. I want an answer for her. Mm-hmm. Maybe it was for me, you know? You were because, sad. You yeah. Were sad for her. As a mom, and you know, even as a dad, we have goals and dreams for our kids, and we we so want them to achieve what it is they, you know, their hearts desire. So I went in there and I sat down and I went through my little process of just creating this landing pad for receptivity. And I determined I was not going to allow my mind to go off here or go off there, go off somewhere else. I was I was visualizing this landing pad for uh, inspiration, for creativity. And so every time a thought would try to come, I, I just know I, I, have this, I have this blank landing pad for an idea. Well, I sat there for 30 minutes, I got nothing. The timer went off and I stood up and I'm like, well, I, and I walked out the door. And as I walked out the door, I heard words. You sometimes hear internal words like, whoa, where did that come from? And what I heard was, she needs to know that he is coming. Mm. And I'm like, what? Where did that come from? It just landed on this landing pad that I had set aside for 30 minutes of not trying to figure it out or solve it, but just say, okay, what? I need to hear something. I heard she needs to know he is coming. Later that day, I was going to go for a walk and I, I, I don't know that I wrote it down. I'm like, okay, what was, that? I, what was that I got? Oh, she needs to know he is coming. I'm standing in my kitchen and all of a sudden I heard the other part, which was he needs to know that she is waiting. Mm-hmm. Isn't that beautiful? It's so beautiful. I love oh, it. I love it. it. Yeah. <laughs> It was like this parallel statement. Mm-hmm. He need, she needs to know he's coming. He needs to know she's waiting. Mm-hmm. I held on to that for about four years. As, you know, uh, putting kind of my life coach hat on, she wasn't receptive. I told it to her. She didn't want to hear it because she was in, not in a place of receptivity, but I was. Mm-hmm. And I could hold, and as a life coach, as a coach, those of you who've done things like that, you know, you stand and you hold the vision for another. And what I did was hold her vision Yes. in a safe place in my heart. She needs to know he's coming. He needs to know she's waiting. And often I didn't say it to her. I just held the vision and he came and he's marvelous. We love him. We adore him. And he even likes us. Mm, I love that. That is an example of what happens when we, we have a purpose and we go into a, a, a time of stillness and we say, okay, radical awe, or humble awe, radical trust. This is where I'm at. I'm creating a land, landing pad. Mm. Wow, that's beautiful. It just occurs to me that while you were, you were purposefully you know, like reigning in your, your mind and creating that space, that blank space so that, you know, God or whatever your thoughts could, you could drop into, right. And be able to give you the answers that you were so desperately seeking. And then nothing came. I love, you know, but when you gave that up, because maybe sometimes we will it too much, like even in standing and clearing that space, you're, there's a measure of control there. So it occurred to me, and I don't know if this means anything to you, but when you stood up and went, okay, I tried that, didn't work, but you're still, that's where your heart is, right? That you're looking for an answer, you're waiting for an answer. Mm-hmm. That's when the answer came. So that's what I heard you say is in thinking about my own life when there's things I'm like, God, I want to hear from you. God, you know, like right now. And, and it's okay to be in that space, but I think the important thing is to be, and I'm trying to think of the word here, when you just give it up. You're flexible. When you are flexible, when you <clears throat> surrender, when you, we surrender. Mm-hmm. Like God knows our intention, yeah. and then we just surrender. 
Because mm -hmm. it's not on our terms. No, on terms. no it isn't. Right. And, and sometimes it will, my dad used to practice this. He would be working on his car. And Chuck will appreciate that. He's in there working on the car when you could work on cars. And he comes up with a problem and he doesn't know what to do. And what he would do, he would go to bed. And very often in the middle of the night, the answer would come to him because see, he's in this, this, this space of not trying to fix, not trying to control, not worrying about, you know, can I do this? Just this sweet surrender to sleep. And he would get the answer. He'd get up in the morning, he'd go out there and he'd fix that car. Yeah, all beautiful examples of the power of surrendering. Yeah, um, it's really what it is. It's just letting go of the fear. It's like, I'm, I'm gonna move it. Uh, if, how many of you have ever watched the movie? I'm sure Chuck hasn't. Uh, Enchanted April. Any of you watch that? Oh my goodness, you've got to watch that. It's the story of um, just after World War I, um, these women from England go rent a villa in Italy. And one of the characters in there comments on it, it's a tub of love. Everything changes about their lives. They, they go for 30 days, they steal themselves. And it's a perfect example of what I'm talking about. It's a very slow moving film, but it's a tub of love. It's a tub mm. of love. And that's what we're moving from. We're moving from, you think about moving from, it's rainy London, it's just coming out of the war. There've been so many, so much loss and, suddenly um, you're in this tub of love hmm. and their lives oh, are never the same. They're never the same. Wow. Well, thank you. Um, so we're just five minutes from our, you know, kind of putting a, uh, ending this time together, but I just want to, make it available if anybody else wants to share anything. I'm curious from Chuck because he, he is a, he's a master at all of this material. Yeah, disc, disc master, master trainer. So I'm mastering silence today. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, well, yeah, I appreciate, I like this kind of stuff, you know, and, uh, but my only, my, my only comment would be on this. There's been so much information that it's like almost overwhelming. You know, I appreciate it, Marley, that you present it today. And, um, but as people who know me know that um, I, I'm a fan of silence, of, of just kind of not checking out, but um, I think in silence is where you learn. Because if you're talking, you can't learn. And uh, so it gives you a chance to create the space for you to reinvent yourself. Like you gave the examples of some people who've kind of done that. Mm -hmm. So I think if we're aware, we take the time to become more aware, more present by, like you said, looking at the flowers and the trees and all that, that uh, we can, you know, it allows us the chance to make better choices because we, we kind of start pushing out our distractions. And so that it, it puts us in a better spot to show up in the world uh, and how to interact better and more thoughtful and meaningful. That's what I get out of it. Mm -hmm. you'll, you'll find it interesting, Chuck. I normally teach this over six weeks. Oh, wow. <laughs> wow. So this was, yeah, this was very, very. Yeah, love here. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Well, thank you, Marley. Thank you, thank you, thank you for sharing your heart your you know your life's work with us your passion mm -hmm. um just really been a treat and for those of you who are listening enjoy i hope you enjoyed this replay um so signing off from uh washington at a time of social distancing with the covid19 i just want to put a, a date stamp on this um uh, today is actually april 15th yeah. April 15th, 2020, when we're having this conversation and um, really appreciate Marley sharing her generosity on how deep stillness creates the space for creativity. So thank you all. Signing off for now. Bye-bye.
Better today. Yeah. <laughs>